So I'm going to try to handle this. Um, so I am, uh, of course, Manuela Piazza to San Guglielmi. Uh, and um, we are both part of an INSERM research group, uh, which is based in uh, Saclay, in uh, Neurospin. It's a big lab for neuroimaging. So we mostly deal with the brain, but of course, and of course, we are very much interested in cognition and in learning. So uh, today we're going to do, tell you about a large collaborative project on uh, learning numbers. Um, that takes place thanks to the support of OLPC and that uh, we perform using the XO computers. So when uh, thinking about learning, um, oh, this is not working. Oh, -hoo. it did work before, of course. Let's see, to do To do means what? Means nothing. Okay, let's, let's use this. Uh, when we think about learning, we have to forget about the old idea that the human mind comes to birth as a tabula rasa, as an equipotential learning device that can learn any kind of information. Instead, we now know th from uh, cognitive neuroscience of development and of learning that the human brain at birth already, and of course the, hu the, the brain of a child, is a highly structured device that is organized heavily already and comprises modules that are systems that are uh, pre-wired to attend to particular uh, features of the physical environment. And these modules, these systems that are pre-existing and that were selected by our long evolutionary history, are very important when we learn new things. In fact, they allow novel learning, but they also give constraints to learning. Let me give you a very immediate, uh, straightforward example in the domain of number cognition. We all know since uh, quite a while now that human babies very, very early when they come to life in this experiment, for example, they were newborns that had an average of 49 hours after being birth, are able to attend and extract number from the sensory environment. This beautiful study run my, by my colleague Veronique Izar run like that. They uh, gather these babies in a room in the maternity and they use the familiarization procedure. They let them hear for two minutes sequences of a given number of sounds. For example, four sounds, do, 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 a pause, and then another four sounds. After these two minutes of adaptation, they showed babies images on a computer screen that could contain either the same number of sounds or a different number uh, of images, or a different number of images with respect to the number of sounds that they heard. And surprisingly, babies already at this very early age look longer at the images that match in number the number of sounds that they have heard. So this shows that they are very sensitive to this aspect, to the numerical aspects of the stimuli. However, of course, they cannot discriminate very well, and they are sensitive only to numerical uh, matches that are approximate. So, for example, they don't make a difference between, for example, six, six versus 18, but they make a difference between 4 versus 12. So they have a sensitivity to number that is very rough, but that still is there. So their extraction and representation of number is very approximate. But it, 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 is, it is a skill that they already have. Not only that, but they can also uh, mentally combine numerical quantity spontaneously, and this shows that they have the ability to perform mental arithmetic. And the experiment that our colleague Mekrin Karan goes like this, nine months old uh, babies uh, were shown these kind of films. So five objects fall, they are hidden, another five objects fall and go in the same box, the box opens up, and if the result is wrong, so 5 plus 5 equals 5, then babies look much longer than when the result that is revealed is correct. 
This means that they had mentally performed their calculation and they have some expectation about these results. And it works as well as with subtraction, stimulation of subtractions. So anyway, we have already uh, discovered that there are particular brain regions that extract numerical quantity and perform numerical calculation. In the monkey brain, uh, hey, What's going on? This is not my presentation. <laughs> I am very sorry about that. So that's okay. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm not going to show you which are the brain regions, but believe me, we have shown through functional imaging, for example, that there are particular regions in the brain of humans that are similar to the same regions of the brain in uh, animals, for example, in macaques, that represent numerical quantities, cardinalities of sets. But the way cardinalities of concrete sets are represented is approximate, such that small numbers are represented more precisely, and as the numerosity increases, the set size increases, the representation is less and less precise, such that indeed what governs mental representation of numerical quantity is a logarithmic coding. So what counts for, uh, for us to know what a person will and will not perceive as a difference between two sets is not their difference, but their numerical ratio. So, for example, we can very well discriminate one versus two dots, and we can as well discriminate 10 versus 20, 100 versus 200. But, of course, we can't discriminate 10 versus 11 unless we start counting. And so this sense of numerical quantity is actually universal. And uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Stanislas Dehan and Pierre Picard, who are also part of this project, had the chance to study a population that is, turns out to be very interesting for us. This population is Munduruku. It's, it's an uh, Amazonian indigenous tribe that lives in the state of Pará in Brazil. Their culture is entirely oral, but most importantly, they have never invited, uh, invented a counting system. And they have words that design cardinalities, but only up to three or four. So why is this culture interesting to us? Because it is interesting because we want to understand whether their sense of quantity is actually impacting them, and in the long term, whether they can, despite the fact that they have this indigenous culture, they can actually learn counting an exact number. So here is uh, the map of uh, uh, the population, the Monduruku territory, and uh, you can see that these uh, different Mm, villages are spread around, especially the river uh, Kururu, and it's comprised, for example, this initial group of several participants, adults and children. And due to the fact that uh, missionary have been installing in this area for quite a long time, now some Munduruku are getting access to some forms of education. So the first school are being built, and some form of education is given to them. Of course, the education that is uh, provided is not at all formalized and ma many times they can there go there for a week and then don't go there anymore. The program that they follow is really rough and approximate. Sometimes they just go there and learn simply orally to speak Portuguese, but sometimes they even uh, learn how to read and write. And uh, so here is a depiction of the demonstration of the fact that their number words are um, very limited. So for example, in this graph, uh, you can see that uh, the um, frequency of the, the amount of uh, trial at which, at, uh, for each stimulus numerosity here, uh, the different subject give different words. And so you can see that pungma uh, mean one, and almost all subject, when they use pungma, is to quantify a set that contains only one item. 
uh, chap chap means two, 100% of subjects use chap chap to quantify two, three, and four. And then when we get to four or five, the, um, the words that are used across participants become very different from one subject to the other. So there is no clear universal system to quantify sets beyond three or four. Um, our colleagues ask this uh, subject to perform this task, which is an approximate calculation task. So they show this animation where items fall in a box, more items fall in a box, but you can't see them anymore. And then there is another set. And the researcher asked the Munduruku whether they thought there were more items in the box or outside the box. And they run this experiment by changing from trial to trial the relationship between the quantity of dots in the box and outside the box. And what they show here, these are graphs for different subgroups of Munduruku, monolingual, bilingual. And this is uh, the proportion of correct response in this comparison experiment as a function of the ratio between what's inside and what's outside. And you can see that as the quantities are different from one the other, the, the ratio is higher, the proportion of response correct increases. And this kind of behavior suggests a logarithmic coding of a numerical quantity, a compressed coding of numerical quantity. And in this graph, you can see an average across all these, and all the Munduruku here in gray perform exactly as the French control. So this, uh, this kind of number sensibility is identical in culture that don't possess symbols for numbers and for exact quantities. Now it's here. All right, so out of uh, these experiments and many other that I don't have the time to, to cover, we can say that all humans share this neurocognitive machinery that provides intuition about approximate number and calculation. However, uh, without symbols, representing exact number and performing exact calculation is impossible. And we can illustrate this um, impossibility by showing another experiment that our colleagues have provided the Munduruku with. So in this uh, simulation, you can see a small number of dots going into the box, but then some are falling off. And if you have symbols for number, you are able to quantify them exactly and to answer precisely and correctly to the question of whether in the box now you have zero, one, or two dots. And indeed, French controls here uh, in this graph, dots, independently of the initial quantity of dots that fall in the box, are perfect in the task, while Monduruku subjects keep behaving in a way that indicates that they are doing approximate calculation. They are not exactly counting. They, they are not able to label them in an exact fashion, and therefore they are not able to perform the exact calculation. A second indication that for Munduruku, uh, there is a big disadvantage, so to speak, not knowing symbols for number, is this, um, we, it's revealed by this kind of task in which uh, there is a line that is presented, which is, um, embedded by two quantities, one dot on one side and 10 dots on the other. From trial to trial, we present subject different kinds of quantities and we ask using a movable cursor to put and position that particular quantity on this oriented line. And of course, uh, using all kinds of stimuli, dots, sequences of tones, even spoken munduruku words, which of course are made up from uh, five on because they are um, mixing of words that mean uh, uh, small numerosities, and also spoken Portuguese. If you ask an adult to perform this task, what you imagine will, will happen is that all quantities will be put more or less linearly on this line, suggesting that we have a notion of the linearity of the numerical continuum. However, if you don't have this notion, because you 
haven't learned symbols for numbers, you treat them as approximate quantities, and therefore you confuse them more larger quantities than you do smaller quantities. And this will end up in a mapping that is more logarithmic than linear. So Munduruku subject plays very far away from the other, the small numbers on the left, and then all around towards the large numbers, the large numbers on the right, such that the relationship between the number that we have presented and the position on the line is logarithmic. While, of course, American participants are always completely linear in this kind of tasks. And this logarithmic coding is present uh, whatever the type of stimuli we present them. All right, so indeed, learning symbols for exact numbers is an extremely slow and effortful process in our children also. There are cultures that never do that, and in our culture, of course, we do, but that is very painful for children. We don't realize that. We ask them to count. They can count very young, and we think, okay, they got it, but in fact, they didn't, and they take ages to really attribute meaning to these words that uh, are uh, cardinal, uh, reflect exact cardinalities. Indeed, at about two years of age, children start understanding the meaning uh, that the fact that these particular words that are numbers mean something related to cardinality. But they don't know what exactly and which exactly cardinality they use. And in order to really assess the knowledge of number names, what we use is the given number task. Given number task is very sensitive to knowledge of meaning of numbers. And it goes, it is a very simple task. You give them puppets, 10, for example, of them. And you ask them from trial to try, can you please give me three puppets? And then you just note what they respond. Even though they can count up to 100, at about two and three years of age, they really don't know what to do with these numbers. Sometimes they give you one, sometimes they give you three, four, five. They have not a systematic understanding. While they, they um, one by one, they start learning the meaning of these words in a way that is strictly serial. That means first they understand the meaning of number one, and therefore when you ask for one, they give you one. But then when you ask for two, they can give you one, two, three, ten. Six months later, they got to two, and six months later, they get to three. So this is a very, very slow process that we don't realize how much change in their mental representation that implies. So this is exactly what we are interested in, what we want to study. So what happens? We think that this is what happens when we have to learn exact numbers. When children learn to count, their approximate number system is already in place. They already have the neural machinery to get the sense of numerical quantity, but that is imprecise. And then we give them these verbal labels that don't have any meaning to them. In order to attach meaning to these verbal labels, they have to connect the cortical representation of these verbal labels to the pre-existing cortical representation of quantity. And this entails a profound modification of the representation of quantity, such that it is transformed from an, exact from an approximate one to an exact one, and from a logarithmic representation to a linear one. And so these are the important questions that with this study we want to start answering. First of all, can Munduruku learn exact number concepts? Despite the fact that in their indigenous culture, number words are extremely limited and they have an approximate meaning. Is number cognition crystallized by culture or is it plastic? Can we change their, their, their representation of, of quantity? Can we teach them exact number using a completely unsupervised, adaptive, uh, computerized training that is important for us when we want to run a proper training study not to have the influence of the teacher so using a computer is very interesting but also for the future if we if we manage to show that we have effective tools for them to learn that will be very helpful and also, we want to see whether we can teach very young children. We have seen that it, it is very difficult for them when they're very young to learn these concepts. Can we push the system? Can we, can we teach them before they do it uh, naturally? Or there are maturational constraints, maybe. And another question that is interesting for us is, is verbal language necessary? to learn exact number concepts? Or can we convey exact number concepts by passing language? For example, using visual sim symbols such as the abacus. 
If that turns out to be true, it would be a very interesting alternative tool for children, for example, that have verbal problems. So uh, the present study is, as I said, a large uh, collaborative one in which uh, different researchers from different parts of the world are involved, uh, USA, France, uh, Brazil, of course, and also Italy. And uh, we are going to test different types of populations. Munduruku people, from seven years old children to adults that are uneducated and that don't have this knowledge of counting and of exact numbers. Italian preschoolers, Brazilian low uh, socioeconomical status profiles such that we can get uh, children that are already older than those in how to uh, count and calculate, and also um, preschoolers in the US where we are going to take also brain measure before and after the training to see the impact of these kinds of training on the brain functioning. So, uh, as I said, we have implemented our program uh, on the ICSO, and so f we have a so-called virtual lab in Amazonia. We have 20 ICSO. Uh, five have been uh, donated, uh, ten have been donated by OLPC France, and so thank you very much. Uh, we bought ten from OLPC uh, Central. Uh, for Italy, we have borrowed some from OLPC France, which we are going to return next week. Uh, for Brazil, we are currently trying to get some more, and in the US, we have been lent ten by OLPC uh, USA. Twenty. Um, all right, so in, in Brazil, that has been a big pain to start up this research because we had to go through CNPq uh, approval, which is the, the National Scientific Council, the um, National Indian Foundation, uh, which gave us uh, approval to run this, and most importantly, we had to have the approval from the Mondoruku population, uh, who is indeed interested in getting education and therefore interested in participating in this study. So Pierre Picard, who is the linguist, most um, uh, expert of the Munduruku culture, who went several times to discuss all these issues, and here are pictures in which he's uh, presenting the, uh, the ICSO uh, to the Mundurukus. Um, so, the logic of the study. We are going to implement pre-tests and post-tests that try to quantify for each individual its ability to uh, make exact numerical judgment through the given number task, uh, small subtraction task, and number to line tasks. The same test will be given before the training and after the training. And the training is an adaptive one. Uh, for the moment, we have implemented it a very short version of, uh, of the training, takes, taking place within nine days to a session a day that lasts for 15 minutes. Uh, there is no individual tutoring. Children are in front of the computer and they figure out after the first day of uh, familiarization, they just do the tests and the training by themselves. And we have different groups in order to compare the effectiveness of different training. The first one just runs uh, approximate comparison. We don't really teach them to count. This is a control group that we want to, um, of course, in the end of the experiment, we will uh, give them uh, the, the, the training, the, the counting training. But for the moment, we have that control group. And then we have other two experimental groups, one doing exact comparison with, in which we teach them to count using the abacus, and the other one, we teach them using verbal symbols in the uh, Portuguese language, of course. <coughs> So here are some pictures of uh, Munduruku. For the moment, Pierre Pica has gathered data from only 16 participants. He is going to go again in the second mission this uh, summer to have uh, more. Uh, and you can see that um, uh, they are using uh, the abacus or uh, performing the task in different condition. There are old and young participants. Um, again, here you can see some pictures, and I don't know whether you want to see a, a small, nice video that uh, Naya Fernandez, uh, photographer, has made for us. Uh, yeah, I can show you. It's uh, short and very nice. It gives you the feeling of what was going on. So 
So this is the Kururu River and we had the chance to have the, built a brand new school in there. So this is quite exceptional. It doesn't look like this in all Munduruku villages. In that place there was a, a new school that was built from the missionaries. And so here it, it was the first day of uh, training. So some Munduruku adults showed the children how the game worked and here are the tests. Some of the tests involved using the abacus and some involved the use of number words. So this is an approximate comparison task. The child is just pointing towards the set that contains more items. And then we measure the sensitivity to this. Here we measure the spontaneous ability to use the one-to-one -one correspondence with the abacus to see whether our training is actually improving on this concept of one-to-one -one correspondence. Here is the give me a number task, but uh, augmented with the physical items because using only the XO was a bit uh, complicated for them. giving the answer and Pierre Picard, the linguist, is typing in the response that the child is giving. So these are the pre and post tests. This necessity for them, the presence of a researcher is necessary because we are measuring their performance before and after, while during training they work completely by themselves. So this is an example of our training which we will show you better later on. So he has to figure out whether there are more in the left or in the right box. Yes. In order to do that, if you only have a sense of approximate number, sometimes you get it right, but sometimes you don't. If you have learned how to count, you can always get it right, of course. Unless you get just distracted every once in a while. All right, so this is Pierre Pica. Okay, so as I said, in the current group, we only managed to gather 16 subjects, but it's already a great start because we know that they actually love the training and they are very attentive and they're very happy to participate, while on the contrary, we have gathered data from um, a 97 uh, Italian preschoolers from which I'm not going to give you the results, but we already have finished that study. So now Tucson is going to show you more directly um, what these, uh, how what this training looks like and the interface that he has created with uh, the different applications for. No. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, unfortunately, we can't uh, show you directly on the the EXO. So I'm going to show you. Uh, the programs uh, running uh, in Pygame, so on, uh, on this computer, and we'll need sound too. So the the prog uh, we have uh, created three activities to um, to run the test and the, the the training, and the first activity is uh, the configuration management. Uh, the because we have multiple uh, test subjects on each computer, we have to manage uh, each one to to manage um, their information, name, age, and all that, and be able to switch user every time we we, we need to. So 
basically since they do two sessions per day, uh, every time a new user comes, a new user comes on the computer, we have to switch him to his uh, to his uh, profile. And we use it also to back up the data on the USB key uh, as often as possible uh, after each test or uh, after each uh, training or after uh, a group of subjects has been uh, passed on the computer so that we, we don't lose data if the computer has a problem, uh, stops working. And we can also migrate the data to another computer. So. Um, so that's uh, Pygame, um, that's all Pygame uh, apps that run on the XO. And um, so there, this is the interface for the tests. So the tests uh, are all done normally, well, in one day. Uh, we try to, uh, w with young children in particular, you cannot necessarily do them all in a single, uh, uh, in a single session, we can we have to might have to to cut them in parts. So we have different kinds of tests. So give me a number with a backus with uh, language. Uh, so to differentiate the language we use to to give to tell them uh, the numbers that we ask them, we have different tasks on the on the panel. Uh, I can show you. Give me a number with an abacus. No, sorry, I can show you. What's on this card with an abacus? Uh, so what's on this? Well, the fact that it's an abacus here is not necessarily important uh, because they re they answer with an abacus as you've seen on the video, uh, and we show them uh, cards with numbers, uh, a different number of items randomly placed on the card. Um, uh, you have seen the animation of the, the subtraction, so it's the same principle. Dots go in, dots go out, and you have to to uh, to give the the, the result. Uh, as you see, when you, you when you finish, well, in this case, I didn't finish. Uh, I quit, but uh, normally when you finish each task. Uh, each test it is checked so that you don't uh, you know that you you have done it. Uh, that's kind of important when you have a long uh, number of tests. Um, so that's the test. Uh, the the data uh, maybe we can. Mm. Hear. Okay, so that's there. Mm. So this is uh, the the give me a number where they are. Uh, that's why they use stones. You know, here you push a button to get more uh, more items, and uh, that that uh, uh, we determine that it's not necessarily very uh, very easy to understand. So uh, they use real objects to to pass the test. Uh, so that's the test. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm going to show you the others. Um, but most, more importantly, here is the training. So, in the training, you start. So that's Munduruku. Uh, he's telling you, "Welcome to the forest. Um, discover what is hidden behind the light." So, the idea is we have an image that gets new elements added uh, every session, every day. Uh, because we determined that they need some encouragement, a good reason to come back and to be curious about what's, uh, what's going on, what, what they will see next. Um, and then uh, we present them with the object. So there are six different objects. Uh, four of them are animals. So we have a, a, an armadillo, a fish, uh, a parrot. And a turtle, uh, which I can show you. So we have different uh, <coughs> animals and objects. The one on the top left is a cashew uh, fruit, the fruit of the cashew nut. <laughs> and as you can hear, the program is speaking because if you wait too long before uh, acting, it will repeat the instructions. 
So here the instruction is uh, press a button to, uh, to put the object in the basket. So you do that. And there they, they ask you, just like we, we, we showed, um, where, are the, where is the, the most object? Uh, in Munduruku, it seems um, kind of it's it, it's a, a, a kind of formulation that is uh, where is the biggest or something like that. I think uh, because they don't really have a, a good way to express uh, just pick the biggest number, for example, or you know it's it's approximate. So if you if you choose correctly, you are rewarded. Uh, and then you go to the next. So this is the first group. As you can see, you you are rewarded if you choose right, and if you choose wrong, they tell you where, uh, what was the correct answer. But that is all. You are not being taught anything. Uh, Apart from the, the whether you were right or correct, you are not taught numbers, you are not taught uh, representation. So here is, um, so I will switch user to a user who is uh, in the group four. And <coughs> so, as you can see, you have the full picture here. So, these users we have uh, on this computer are the users from the Munduruku training. So, they have all completed, well, most of them have completed the training. So, uh, you have the, the, the entire picture, uh, which is inspired by uh, Munduruku drawings, uh, actual Munduruku art uh, that was used to inspire the style of the of the image. So as you can see, uh, in the counting uh, group, uh, so you are uh, you are taught the numbers as you count, as you go. And then we expect them to develop a strategy of counting so that they will, uh, they will count what is in the right uh, basket and compare it to what they counted as it went into the left basket. So so if you are right, okay, I was right, sorry. <laughs> so if you are right, it just tells you uh, good, uh, uh, what is it, 13 is bigger than 11 or something? And if you are wrong, you get to see the counting Again. So that you learn uh, to count the, the items as they go and you learn the numbers that are associated with the quantity. Um, if you, uh, so in the group three, um, I don't know. So we need a group three. C'est un groupe two. Ah. No, si si, il y a un groupe two. Bah, on va faire un groupe three. Alors, new user. Uh, yeah, that's right. In the in the Mundo Encouragement, they didn't run the group three yet. Um, whatever. Un groupe. So the group three is the abacus group. Chip, 
Yeah, we have to wait for that. <laughs> so in this case, we are have the the numbers the the items go in the basket and the quantity represented by the the by the the abacus counted on the left only uh, in the first uh, in the in the stimulus uh, hoping that they will have a mental representation of uh, the the of the <laughs> of the quantity on the right and um, when they choose we give them that representation to teach them that representation uh, but only uh, uh, in the feedback and if they are wrong uh, like for the the other um, the other group we count both uh, both both baskets with the visual representation of the the abacus so as you can see on the top there is a a, a guy walking on a line or in front of a line actually uh, showing the progression inside the the day of tr of uh, of training or inside the session of training and uh, well that's part of trying to, to, to give uh, an, uh, an idea of where they are at in the, in the test so that they, they, know, uh, they know how long uh, it, uh, how long they have to go. This, so an entire trial is an entire session is comprised of 15 trials and uh, it takes 15 to 20 minutes depending of um, uh, of, of course, uh, the speed of the of the user. Um, <laughs> so, um, so in the end, when all the tests, uh, all the the training has been made, we go back to the test, and uh, the the data from the tests is uh, well. The data from the test is um, saved, as I said, uh, as often as possible on multiple keys, you know, to make sure we don't lose data, we don't uh, lose anything if a computer breaks. Um, and, um, well, I think I've shown uh, the training. So uh, Manuela is going to show you some of the results. We have some of the Munduku study. Also, I wanted to point out something that I forgot to tell you. Well, I, I told you, but very quickly, is that this game is adaptive in the sense that if subjects made 80% of the trial correct, then it will increase in difficulty. And how do we, if it doesn't, then it will stay at the same level of difficulty. And um, increasing levels uh, have been designed in this way. Um, for the exact counting group, we start from numerosity one to three, the first day, and then every level implies introducing a new number of words. So at level uh, two, for example, we introduce number four, so in, in participant will have to compare four versus two, four versus three, but not more. And every day they get to learn a new number. While for the approximate group, what happens is that uh, we present small and large quantities, but the ratio between the two becomes smaller and smaller. So it becomes more and more difficult, and we hope to refine their approximate number sense in this sense. Um, the exact counting group uh, is such that uh, there is always a difference between the two com to be compared sets of one or two, such that if you wanted to try to solve these problems using your approximate sense, you're going to fail. Okay, so very quickly, I just gathered these results very recently, so it's a very uh, sort of uh, quick analysis that we have run, and first of all, we can see uh, how uh, well uh, these Mondurusco subjects are progressing. Um, so here you have 
the session number, meaning uh, how many times they've logged in, so they started playing. And we have uh, 18 sessions. And here is the level of difficulty. As I said, in the, uh, in the exact group, numbers up to three are presented at level zero. For example, at level eight, we have arrived to 11, and at level 18, we have arrived, uh, or 17, actually, we have arrived up to 20. While and numerosity from one to 20, so the same range of numerical quantities, are presented starting from scratch to uh, the approximate group, but the numerical ratio is three to four to be compared, and it gets to most difficult comparison that are sets that differ from a ratio of eight to nine. And so you can see that the verbal counting group, we haven't run up to now the abacus training, we only had the verbal counting, that improved very, very well. They get almost up to level uh, 11 or 12 on average, meaning that they managed to perform exact calculation with numbers about, at about uh, 12 or 13. Um, then we can look not only at the progression, the progression of course is saved as the subject goes on, but also we can compare performance before and after the training. And what we show here, I put some statistic, but it's absolutely in, impossible to believe about that because 16 subjects, uh, we're not really allowed to run statistics, but I run it anyway to show that even with this small group, we get already significant results. So, for example, let's look at this graph. They give me a number in Portuguese. So, we ask them from trial to trial to give different quantities from 1 to 8. For example, give me 8 or 8 in Portuguese, and then they give you with the stones. And you can see that the counting group at the beginning was making many more errors than at the end. While the approximate group, here the groups, pre-test, are not balanced. It is something that we will have to correct for the future, such that the group, the subjects that are uh, attributed to each group are almost more or less equal before doing training, otherwise it's going to be difficult to, to see the effect of training. So they should be, and in the end they will be equal uh, here, which is at pre-training, pre but you can already sh see that even though they were much worse, the subjects that, that were trained with an approximate uh, game are not getting better at this exact counting, which is trivial, but still, I mean, it works. Um, Using the small numerosity subtraction, the task that I had shown you before, dots come in, come out, you have to decide whether there are left one, zero, or two, uh, you can see that the group that improved most before, after versus before is the group that learned counting, but also there is some uh, improval in the uh, approximate group, which we still have to understand and we will have to see whether it holds when we add more subjects. Um, in the approximate comparison group, we hope, we imagine that the group, the subject that uh, have run the approximate comparison for nine days will be better at approximate comparison, even if it's another context, because the test and the training look completely different and are made up of different stimuli. And indeed, um, the approximate group get better at this dots, uh, uh, large dots comparison task. Also, there is a tendency for the counting group to get better, which is something that we would expect, because you learn how to count, even though you can't count, your, your representation of quantity has been refined. So, uh, sorry for just the very, very few observations, but this is still very premature. Uh, but uh, we can already conclu conclude by looking especially at the progression that the exact number training seems to work quite well. Uh, subjects seem to extend their knowledge of exact quantification and use Portuguese novel Portuguese words that refer to numbers that they didn't know before in an appropriate way. And if I uh, try to get a general conclusion of this talk, I have to say that uh, thanks to these computers, uh, we have started this big project and it's become a reality. 
and uh, uh, we also plan to keep using this ZXO for our experimentation in the future, especially with children. With preschoolers, we have seen that absolutely love working with the ZXOs because of their aesthetics, because of their graphic. I don't know, but they really much more appreciated working with the ZXO compared to any other computer or tablet. So we'll keep using them for children especially. And going beyond uh, theoretical research question that I've sketched out at the beginning of the talk, if this training really proved to be effective, then we may work again on that and more on that to turn them into proper learning tools that we can distribute and uh, have them uh, used on a much larger scale. And eventually, I didn't talk at all about dyscalculia, but that's uh, this well, learning disability that is equal to dyslexia, but in the number in the domain of calculation, and where we uh, maybe uh, will be able to use these kinds of training to help them uh, improving their uh, skills in in maths and calculation. So uh, I think we are in time, and so a big thank to OLPC France first of all, uh, OLPC in general, and everybody that was involved in this research. So if you have a question, I hope you have a question, we are here to answer. And, uh, and a symbol or how it's, uh, how it's uh, portrayed. And so I, I, I was wondering, I think you had mentioned um, that you had uh, separated out uh, bilingual subjects from monolingual subjects. Did, did, did you find that there was a, a difference between monolingual and bilingual? No, not in these uh, approximate tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, as for our training, we still have very few subjects to be able to say anything. And actually, I haven't separated out in our 16 uh, people group, the bilingual but monolingual, but it will be uh, absolutely very interesting. However, if you have noticed, even the subjects that are bilingual, so in principle they know how to speak in Portuguese, they also know number words in, uh, number words in Portuguese, so they can recite the sequence. If we ask, and when we ask them to place these number words on this oriented quantity line, they still are logarithmic, meaning that uh, you, don't transfer, you, don't, you don't transfer the knowledge that is implicit in Portuguese language that these symbols uh, mean exact number. For them, they are basically mapped onto the Munduruku symbols that have approximate numbers. So in that case, um, it wasn't giving them an advantage to be, to be bilinguals, because that didn't go with the switch in the mental representation. It was just uh, reciting a given sequence. Uh, yeah. Also, what we know about calculation and uh, numerical abilities in bilinguals is that for tasks such as approximate calculation, there is no cost for bilinguals if they are, for example, trained in one language and tested in the other. If you are in a context of approximation, how much is this plus that? However, if you uh, teach exact calculation, like uh, tables and stuff like that, then in that case, you stick to one language and you have a, a cost when you test on the other language. That's why if you ask bilinguals, trilinguals, they always tell you that their tables, they think about them in the language they learned. But other than that, I mean for maths and approximate calculation, that there is no problem. En français, pardon. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez revenir rapidement sur l'intérêt du XO par rapport à d'autres portables dans votre expérimentation Alors, premier intérêt, dans l'Amazonie, n'importe quel autre ordinateur serait moins adapté pour euh, la simple raison qu'il est beaucoup plus résistant. Euh, 
Uh, or, okay. Uh, whoo, I am trilingual. Um, yes, so first of all, for the Amazon project, it had to be so. I mean, it didn't had to, but it helped very much because uh, these are resistant. They have to be taken on boats. Uh, they can be handled in not with great care by young children and also by adults that don't really know how to interact with these objects. So that's why, since the project started off as being focused on, on the Munduruku uh, aspect, then we decided to go with the Ixo. But also, uh, as I said, I mean, we tried with young children, and for some reason that I still have to figure out, <laughs> they really seem to appreciate that the object, uh, the interface, and they really, really like to work on it. Uh, then, of course, we have the expertise uh, uh, with programming in, uh, in PyGay, but that's not specific to the to sugar environment. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, this would be the answer uh, to that. Also, possibly, I mean, optimizing our, uh, our uh, programs for the XO will make it possible to install it to, uh, to the XOs that exist and that are used in, in populations that are spread around the world and especially in developing countries, which is possibly the place where these kinds of training are going to be most useful. Donc, j'ai une question par rapport à la vidéo que vous nous avez montrée. Donc, on voit qu'ils utilisent de vrais abacs. Oui, on euh, les a construits. <rire> Et donc, là, sur l'application, la, ce sont des abacs. Combien de temps il leur faut pour passer de la maîtrise de l'abac matériel à, à celui qui est dans le logiciel C'est une excellente question. On a vu que... Euh, alors, comme je viens de vous dire... Oh. As I said, uh, uh, Alora. <laughs> now, as I said, uh, we haven't tried the, the abacus training with the Munduruku population yet, but we did try it with the preschoolers, Italians, and it was very hard. It is very hard uh, to oblige them to. In fact, we had to oblige them to use the physical abacus. Because otherwise, and probably this, we have to rethink possibly the, uh, the ergonomic of that. Um, because otherwise they would, because we leave the, the abacus of one of the two baskets on with the representation of number that is inside, then they go with the one-to-one -one correspondence with that abacus. And this is not very, I mean, it's already something because it's training the one-to-one -one correspondence, but I really think that acting upon this uh, object would be much more um, helpful. Uh, there are two ways to go. One is to take away the, the abacus on the screen so that unless they do it, they won't be able to increase uh, in their progression. And the second one is to have a touch screen such that it will be more intuitive to compare the two objects because they really look the same and they are in the same environment. However, with the XOs we have, we can't do it. So. C'est bon Ok, merci.